we got this bug report. It said, I never get the notifications when we run out of stuff. And it went on to explain that they were warned when they were running low on something, so they knew to make plans to replenish, but then they'd try to use the resource and they'd already be out. And the context here is a game. It's an online, multiplayer, zombie apocalypse, role-playing game. And running out of stuff is problematic. The notifications get triggered on various events. For example, when zombies are spotted, or when people join or leave tribes, and of course, anything to do with gaining or losing resources. The notification in question is resource depleted. And the cause of the bug was that for all of our notifications, we had a text version of the notification that goes to some notification channels, and uh, an HTML version of the notification that goes to other notification channels, and they were defined separately. Now, as you may have, might have guessed, this is a copy-paste error. We copied the resource-scarce notification to create resource-depleted and forgot to edit the HTML. Now, you might be thinking, shouldn't the tests have caught this? And the truth is, yes, they should have. And they probably would have if we had written any. So yeah, the notify package is kind of awful and there are no tests. Now we were actually okay with this. The first uh, notifications that we implemented, they weren't really all that important. They, there weren't many of them for one and they were really straightforward. Over time, they started becoming more and more central to the mechanics of the game. We implemented more notifications and they got a lot more complex. And the bug report served as a signal that it was time for us to try to get control of this part of the code base. And the first step was to add tests. Now here's what makes it tricky to test. The functions in the notify package call our, uh, some functions on our comms package, which in turn talk to a third party pub sub service. And that service was devilishly difficult to test. Now there might be a way to configure the comms package to let us test it, but we're not trying to test the comms package, we're trying to test the notify package. We don't care about all of this complexity. It's all incidental to our purpose. What we want to know is did the message say the right thing and did the right people get the message? Now it turns out there's a very careful dance that you can do that makes it utterly trivial to test this feature. With this maneuver, you will never be more than 30 seconds, 60 seconds away from a, a production deploy at all times throughout the entire process. And it's called the no-op, no-op, no-op interface maneuver. What the no-op, no-op, no-op interface maneuver lets you do is move things around in tiny increments until we can tell the notification function who to talk to for all of their communication needs. Then in production, we'll use a real transmitter, and in test, we can pass in fake transmitters to just keep track of what happens. Almost every step in this process is safe. And safe has a precise technical definition in this context. Safe means that you can reverse the step with a single undo. So a safe step is one edit. The code will work before and after the edit, and if it doesn't, you can back it out with a single undo. Now there's one moment where the code won't work, but it's very brief, and you can lean on the compiler to fix it. So here we go, three no-ops and an interface. The very first thing that you're going to do is not change any existing code. Now this is very important. All of the existing code works, and working code pays the bills. So here are the existing comms functions, which you're not going to change yet. In this package, define a new type, and it kind of doesn't matter what type you use for this because it's not gonna have any fields or data or values, it's just a placeholder. It's a hook where you can attach some methods. 
Now, since our notification code calls three functions, we're going to define three methods on this type, one for each function. And each method needs to have the same function signature as the original function, and each method should be empty. And back in each of the old functions where you already have mountains of code, you're going to add a single line to each function that calls the equivalent method on a value of type signal. That value is a package variable that's just a nil pointer. And since the methods are defined on that pointer, this works without ever assigning anything to it. So that's no op number one. We created a new type with empty methods and updated the code to call those methods. The original comms functions are doing two things. First, they're doing all of their actual work, and then they're calling a method which does nothing. Move all of the work from the old function to the new method, and that is no op number two. The notification is still calling the old function, the old function is calling the new method, and the new method is now doing all of the heavy lifting. Now we want to cut the middleman out of this transaction. We have this new type, we want our notify package to talk to it directly, and to do this we need to change the notify fun function signature in order to accept a new argument which is a value of this new type. And we do this in three small steps. First, add the parameter to the function signature. Now the code won't compile and then update all the callers to pass the package variable that we defined, and now the code compiles again, and everything works. The body of the function is still talking directly to the comms package. Update this to use the com argument instead, and now the original comms functions are no longer being called, and we can delete them. And that's no op number three. We injected the dependency into the notify function and got the function to talk to the injected dependency. So we added all of this code in order to keep doing exactly what we were already doing. And we still can't add tests. And this is where the magic happens. In the comms package, define an interface that corresponds to the three methods on the signal type. And then in the notify package, change the type of the parameter to be the interface type instead of the concrete type. Everything still compiles, everything still works. And now finally we can implement a fake transmitter type in the notify package, defining the methods on it that it needs in order to satisfy the transmitter interface. And these methods should be trivial. Capture whatever information you need and then verify whatever you want in your tests. So three no-ops, one interface. The first no-op defined a new type and hooked it into the code. The second no-op moved the work into the methods on this type. And the third no-op eliminated the need for the original functions by getting the code to call these methods directly. And finally, defining an interface made it possible to inject fake transmitters, which made it trivially easy to implement the tests for the feature. Now, the point of all of this is to make it safe to clean up and simplify the notify package. And to clean this up, I'm going to ignore everything that is known about good design, design patterns, design principles, because most of the time when I'm looking at legacy code, I have absolutely no idea what it should look like. I don't know where I'm going. It's just this giant, overwhelming mess. But even though I don't know where I'm going, I do know how to get there. And it's a process that Sandy Metz calls the flocking rules. It's named after the incredibly complex behavior that's exhibited in nature by flocks of birds or schools of fish where each individual is following a few simple rules. The flocking rules for eliminating duplication go like this. Find the things that are the most alike select the smallest difference between them, make the smallest change that will remove that difference. The beauty of these rules is in repeating them over and over again and discovering what emerges. So let's start with a notification that exhibits a lot of problematic duplication, the resource found notification. This has about 100 lines of code, 
but we're only going to look at the little bit that caused the bug that we saw at the very start, the part where we build two versions of the same notification independently of one another. So here's the text version of the notification. It's got a simple format string, and it's passing in some game values. And the HTML is doing basically the same thing, except there's more of everything. And the format string handcrafts HTML, and it passes in heaps of data. So the flocking rules. Find the things that are the most alike. It's not always obvious where to begin. If you have a number of choices that all seem reasonable, pick one. If you have no idea where to begin, pick something and try it. And you'll quickly figure out whether or not it was a useful place to begin. And here it seems like the two format strings are a plausible choice. So I'm going to collapse all of the data arguments for a bit to make it easier to focus on the format strings. Select the smallest difference between them. So where the plain text version has simple formatting verbs, the HTML version has hard-coded HTML anchor tags with multiple format verbs for each of them. Make the smallest change that will remove that difference. If we pass the entire anchor tag as arguments to sprintf, then the format string becomes identical in both cases, and the messy bits of the HTML get extracted into new and smaller format strings. And we can collapse the identical bit into a temporary variable and then repeat the form flocking rules. So what's most alike? Well, the anchor tag creation code that we just extracted suddenly seems much more repetitive than it did when it was embedded in all of that HTML. So what's the smallest difference? Well, again, there are a few options here. Let's start with href. And how can we make the hrefs identical? Well, the cleanest thing would probably be to define a URL method on the individual game types. And to be fair, we really shouldn't be hand coding these all over the place anyway. So once we've done that and we call those URL methods, things are looking considerably less noisy. So repeat the flocking rules. That template escaping thing is really similar. The only difference between them is the argument that we're passing. In the first two cases, we're referencing struct fields. And in the third, we're calling a method. And there is no reason why we cannot call methods everywhere. So define a string method on the other two game types, and then repeat the flocking rules. And the anchor tags are now almost identical. The only difference between them is the game value that we're calling the methods on. Notice that we're calling the same two methods on all of the game values, string and URL. And these make up a tiny interface. Just hasn't been defined yet. We need a name for the interface. And because these are used to define links, I'm thinking linker. And now we can extract the creation of the anchor tag to a function that takes a linker. And this completely removes the repetitive bits for making HTML links leaving us with just the repetition in creating the notifications themselves. The duplication is now more obvious, and the differences more subtle. Take a look at the way that we're processing the data arguments in the HTML notification. We're handling them all consistently. In the text version of the notification, we're not. We're referencing the struct fields on a couple of arguments, and the string method is being implicitly called on the last one. Now, we've already dealt with this for the linker. All of the game types have a string method, and that method would do the right thing here. So we can stop referencing the struct fields altogether and let sprintf take care of the details. We're very close to identical. The difference is that the text version is using the game values straight up, whereas the HTML version is passing them to the link function first. And we can make them even more similar by defining a text function that takes a linker. Now, this seems a little bit pointless, but it's worth being just a little bit pedantic when you're following the flocking rules, because it can push you to do things that are unintuitive. They'll lead you to some interesting outcomes. So now the shape is the same everywhere. We're still working on this little bit of duplication here. 
The difference is the name of the function that the arguments get passed to. The two functions have the same signature, so we can create a formatting function that takes a function with that signature as an argument. And it would also need to take the format string and the game values that are being used as the data. And in this function, loop through the game values and then pass them to the function that we passed in before running it all through sprintf. And finally, those two lines of code are identical. This smells like a type. All of these things belong together. They deserve to be an actual thing, not a collection of seemingly unrelated things that happen to line up. If we create a type that stores a template and some game values along with a function that will make new messages, we can move the formatting function so that it's a method on this type. And then with a couple of wrapper methods, the body of the notification ends up looking like this. We started out with an undifferentiated mass of stringy stuff and ended up with two crisp abstractions. A message type, which knows how to render itself as plain text and HTML, and a linker interface, which allows us to represent game values agnostically in the notifications. Applying the flocking rules systematically over and over again allows you to transform code with a series of seemingly insignificant increments. You don't have to know where you're going. The accumulation of these tiny changes brushes away the jumble that hides beautiful and simple abstractions. Look for the tiny differences. Eliminate them and then name what's left. Thank you. <laughs>